Okay, well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the final session for today. Um, that, well, that is to introduce fraud uh, in attendance with us today, talking about Eurovision fish as critical resource. Um, and we've been exploring a lot about the resource politics, the um, historical colonial relationships, the neo-colonial relationships, um, and formations that inform um, global governance, including conservation policy today. And we're going back to look at some of these questions through Ford's artistic research. So fraud is made up of the duo Audrey Samson and Francisco Gallardo. Critical spatial practitioners, they develop modes of art-led inquiry, which examine the process of financialization through extractive data practices and cultivate critical cosmogeny building. Fraud has been awarded the state of Lower Saxony HBK Braunschweig Fellowship, the King's College Cultural Institute grant, and has been commissioned by the Contemporary Art Archipelago and the Cocaine Foundation. Recent work includes Carbon Derivatives, the 57th Venice Biennale, the Whitechapel Gallery, London, and Somerset House, London, shrimping under working conditions that was shown at Kunsthal Trondheim and the Empire Remains shop in London. And we're joined very luckily by Francisco live today, who is one, one of the only speakers who is actually able to make it to Lisbon in this current moment of um, COVID restrictions. And Audrey is joining us on Zoom from London. So we have a completely hybrid arrangement. So I'll hand over to you now, um, Francisco, and take it okay. away. Okay, Thank uh, thanks, thanks uh, Luisa, uh, for inviting us and uh, for reaching out um, to talk about innovation. Thanks a lot for Matt, uh, for the logistical uh, uh, strugglings. Uh, um, thanks a lot to TBA, uh, for Angela, for in, you know, allowing this to, to happen. Um, Audrey is, uh, was unfortunately not able to join because you know, COVID border restrictions. Um, but uh, we're going to start um, just now. Audrey, are you there? Yes. Unclaimed latifundium, eat more, fish further. Francisco Franco's fascisticized modernity constructed Europe's biggest extraterritorial fishing fleet. Self-sufficiency and authoritarianism were conflated by dictators such as Franco, and it was often mobilized by mythologizing artisanal fishing. However, in parallel, he developed and deployed a deep sea fishing industry that ultimately devastated local fisheries and shaped the contemporary topography of transnational fishery agreements. Franco's agenda was partly disseminated in cinemas through programs called NODO, an acronym for Noticiario y Documentales, News and Documentaries. Nodos constructed the myth of Francoist modernity, which included the aggressive development of industrial fisheries, supported by the nostalgic backdrop of artisanal river fishing. A classic in spring Nodo episodes is Franco's yearly fishing trip to Galicia.
These nodos portraying the skillful fisherman Franco functioned in juxtaposition with those documenting his presence at the inauguration of industrial fishing fleets and naval building factories. Franco developed a fleet uniquely adept at deep sea long haul fishing with dramatically increased capacity. In 1939, the Naval Credit Act encouraged industrial fishing by providing low-cost credit for fishing fleet construction and renewal with long-term repayment schemes. fleet radically increased in size and with it, of course, overfishing along the Spanish coasts. In 1953, the minimum set for trawlers was 150 gross tons. This exacerbated the exhaustion of the local Galician and Cantabrian fishing grounds and also further intensified and validated extraterritorial fishing. Far from supporting the traditional fishing portrayed in his vacations, Franco instituted laws that championed industrial fishing at the expense of artisanal methods, such as the Ley de 1961, which used public money to promote shipbuilding with refrigeration systems. Also in 1961, the Galician company Pescanova built the world's first fishing freezer vessels, which allowed long haul deep sea fishing in the global south. Desde las 150 mil toneladas de registro bruto, construidas en 1961, llegaron a las 900 mil en 1961 y esperan sobrepasar los 2 millones en 1981. Pescanova also built the Vimianzo a vessel that allowed fishing over the stern as well as the side, once again dramatically increasing fishing capacity. By 1972, Spain was the third largest fleet in the world. The establishment of exclusive zones in 1977 hindered Spain's extractive strategies, precipitating fishing agreements with third countries to permit the, quote, survival of the bloated Spanish fleet. These agreements with so-called third countries, such as the EU-Morocco Fisheries Partnership Agreement, 
are attestments to colonialism rebranded or offshoring extraction. This nationalist bravado and ideas of imperial appropriation are entrenched in the fisheries partnership agreements that the EU, that the EU negotiates today, as well as in marine conservation. Pass it over to Fren. Uh, so with the end of uh, Francisco Franco's regime and the introduction of the exclusive economic zones, uh, the the former colonial empires were no longer uh, able to fish in foreign waters. The era, the era of fishery partnership agreements began. That era is what we call a revision. Uh, and before we delve this uh, further and think about how fish became a resource, uh, we would like to begin to consider different forms of enclosure. The fishery partnership as both an enclosure and an ocean graph. In other words, in the same way in which the aquarium that we've seen before performs and validate the scientific case of the Enlightenment, the partnership agreement adds as a mode of enclosure that validates its management. Now enter our protagonist, a classified document. Following the protocol of classified documents, the report was made available in a room only accessible to members of the European Parliament Fisheries Committee. One person at a time without phone, without translator, without assistance, without even a pencil or a notepad. And the document was available only in French. No translations available. The document in question was the controversial 2010 evaluation report of the EU-Morocco Fishery Partnership Agreement, or FPAs. With Elizabeth Dodd's words in mind, and I'd like to read, what survives in the public record are bureaucratic reports and balance sheets, calculations about what was extracted at what cost. History as we know it is a series of environmental impact assessment, a record of damages. So we are looking into the infrastructures of extraction through bureaucratic reports, such as, such as the one that we have seen just before. And we're going to introduce very briefly the project that was developed for the Library of Latin and Sea, for the Istanbul the San Dinaila, that we call partnerships, how to harvest fruit without sowing seeds. But this project, or the starting point, was the previously introduced protagonist, so, as a public body, the EU mandates evaluation reports for all and every of its agreements every four years. At this point, you may be wondering why was this report classified and made so impossible to access, especially in the context of this being a report for the public consultants. So, in this report, it was, uh, it was stated that the agreement was not economically beneficial for the EU. It was environmentally devastating for the northwest coasts of Africa. And it was illegal because it was ratified without the Western Sahara permission, as it includes its waters. So one of the aims of, of, of fraud um, was to intervene in this report, together with Francisca Rosado, who is also in the audience patiently, and Jessica Almal. Here, what you see is a reworking of this document. It includes a highlighting of the deleted sections that still remain classified, and sections that outline its problematic financial, environmental, and political aspects within it. 
The problematic aspects of this report was shrouded in approximately 100 pages of verbose impact assessment. What emerged from this was that the beneficiaries are mostly private companies, the majority of which are Spanish, and the majority of which date back to the Francoist regime that we have seen in the introduction. So therefore, one important aspect for us was to develop a kind of architecture that turns the inaccessibility of these fishery policies inside out, a form of counter-architecture where you know, these policies could be discussed and, and translate and, and make it public and available. So here, uh, one of the propositions was the EU policy watchtower. We're talking about a uh, master watchtower the other day. And it will work as a form of assembly and a witness seminar as a discussion of similar policies. So the structure, we were greatly influenced by tuna watchtowers that are, uh, they used to be dotted in north and south coast of Africa. And they have this dual uh, function of uh, border, border control for the movement of population between the south and north of Africa, as well as defensive. But importantly, they started to be used as a, as a, as a tuna watchtower, as a way to, to see tuna, sardines, and anchovies from afar and their reflection on them. In studying the genealogy of the Spanish uh, fisheries uh, that were developed in Franco, we found, as you have seen before, extensive propaganda footage that depicts uh, a kind of a sort of support of artisanal uh, fishery, local fishing, you see here Franco fishing, however, all the while supporting brutal industrial fisheries development. This eventually exhausted local fishing grounds and propelled Spanish feet to fish to extraterritorial waters. So much so that Spain during this period of time became the third largest fishing fleet. And it's a legacy that continues to this day, as Audrey has said, through the partners in the EU and, and the, the EU and the partnership that the EU negotiates. This constitutes what Leon Campbell calls pelagic imperialism. Pelagic imperialism is characterized by the constant opening of new commodity frontiers in new spaces and capturing new species as others became commercially extinct. This predicated upon a notion of oceans have an infinite bounty. It's immortal. This has brought us to consider what kind of frameworks can produce the system of validations and perpetuation of structure. So within the capitalist regime of financializing nature, one that is sometimes espoused by neoconservationists, the notion that underlines everything that we have considered is the understanding of fish as a stock, fish as a resource, one that can be extracted like phosphate or lithium. A framework that we have recently found and is useful for us to think with um, is one that links the relationship between international relations, trade, economic policy, and of course, border security. And this lens is the Critical Raw Materials Initiative. In the case of the EU, a uh, Critical Raw Materials Initiative was adopted by the Commission in 2008. The UK will adopt its own very soon. And it essentially defines a strategy to access materials that are imperative to the subsistence of the EU. However, while ensuring the EU subsistence, it has brought a series of treaties and agreements, uh, such as the one discussed earlier, which, which has led to the exhaustion of resources in the Global South. So we're interested in exploring the frameworks of extractions, what enables it. The basis of, of the graph that you see is the EU critical raw materials graph and it shows where materials figures in terms of criticality. Criticality here, not understand in terms of the uh, uh, schools of thought, but rather according to supply risk and economic importance. Our proposition here was to, to introduce uh, uh, new materials such as fish that are not included and labor because they figure so prominently in the treaties that the EU signs and agreements. And for us, it's become a way to understand how these resources are managed, but also to highlight the deficiencies that are embedded within these models, be the fish or phosphate. 
that are here decontextualized from the conditions of, of extraction as well as environmental social relationships. So bringing back some of these relationships is a genealogy to the forest, what we're trying to do in our practice. So a bit of history. Some historians argue that the history of, of uh, critical raw materials go back to the G7 or G7 plus one, because it's the first time that the EU makes it, into one of these uh, summits, in, in basically in the year that was born, 1983, allegedly to deal with arms deals with Russia, but basically what create is the infrastructure that allows commodity market and the basis for raw materials trading you know, up to this day. However, we argue that the genealogy of these policies go back to the extractive imaginaries, and this links with one of the presentations before that we had about Alantropa. And some of these uh, extractivist uh, fantasies, one of the most important ones was Eurafrica. It's this, this model by which the European integration project was built and is and explicit, bind, explicitly binding the extraction of African resources to the, to the projects of EU integration. These others, but I don't have time to go into details. Some of them, they are uh, a bit uh, better explained in the, the series of podcasts that we have been putting out. Another, another resource that we thought us also to bring into the conversation with fisheries, uh, and also uh, this one does uh, feature in the critical raw materials initi initiative, and we have investigated. And the, the EU extracts from elsewhere is sand. Sand is fundamental uh, to the development and to the blue economy. And as we can see later, it's a crucial link between conservation, imperialism, and tourism. That's also like themes that we have been exploring in the workshop. And of course, sand binds land and sea. Hable Rubio, which is the cultural name for sand in Spanish, blows uh, from uh, Western Sahara and Central Sahara all the way to the Canary Islands, but also for the Western feeding the Amazon forest because uh, contains high content of phosphate. On the other hand, Hable has, uh, has critical for many domains, such as construction, but also very importantly for agriculture in dry conditions, such as sand bed agriculture. Sand bed agriculture started in, in the Canary Islands, uh, effectively, and later it moved to Madeira and constitute the blueprint of modern intensive agriculture and earlier on of the plantation economy, of the plantation complex that was exported to the Caribbean. The extraction of Hable started when Spain annexed Western Sahara, or so-called Spanish Sahara at that time, after the Berlin Conference, which is also explored in one of the episodes, uh, which discussed the impacts of the Berlin Conference in the African the European continent. But returning to sand, uh, key in, in tying the Canary Islands and the newly acquired frontiers in North Africa and Western Sahara was Spanish official archaeology from the, from the 39s onwards. So the weaponization of archaeology and the, and the manipulation of narratives, something new, has been done in Germany and in Italy. But in Spain, in this case, um, there was this uh, established prehistoric fictions between Western Sahara and the Canary Island. They were put forward some ethnocentric speculations that state that the primitive, and I have to quote, occupants in North Africa and the Canary Islands came from the Iberian Peninsula, not from Portugal, only from Spain. And since it was argued that North Africans uh, were originally from Spain, you know, it was only natural that it belonged, and the occupation was validated. This was a key tool in Franco validation narratives. The vessel that you see here, the Canary Ganigo, is one of the main protagonists in these archaeological fictions that were put forward and developed by the regime, particularly because it was, it was pegged to Western Saharan ceramics. It was, meant, it was argued that it was a, a, a ceramic buried in this desert wadis to collect rainwater. On the last 20 years, Western Sahara sand 
is being used to build the biggest artificial beaches in the world, which are all in the Canary Islands. As fishing towns became slowly emptied because of depleting fishing stocks, and became areas pegged for tourism development, we became very interested in exploring the link between tourism and extraction. The relationship is, is a very old one. Frank, we used uh, uh, tourism as a way to validate the last authoritarian regime in Europe. Uh, but very importantly, tourism in Can Canary Islands was key to finance infrastructure in mainland. This is something that the Moroccan government is applying in the occupied territories of Western Sahara as a way to validate the occupation. So we are remember a reminder of a quote of Bush and Fletcher, the conservation and ocean management became a colonial movement, part of a broader colonial state building exercises in the service of empires. And this happened mostly through tourism. These are some of the most uh, famous uh, tourist developments. They involve the use of sand, also uh, groundbreaking salmotherapy treatments in the Canary Islands, all using uh, legally sand, legally mined sand from the Sahara. As a way to draw attention to this plunder, we have been working with sand uh, from the Canary Island beaches to make glass. A very ancient transformation and here you can see some of the early glass making experiments made by a glass blower Torsten Roth, which we work and to eventually shape the glass using traditional methods. Uh, here are some of the beaches uh, from which the sun was taken. It's a feast to the eye to see beaches completely empty during lockdown and COVID. Um, this is, this is also interesting because there are new beaches appearing because of the lack of disturbances from tourism. So it's, it's creating this kind of new process of, of, of sedimentation that has not been observed until this day. But it's, in, it's interesting because this is devastated Canary Islands, uh, Gran Canaria and others, which are dependent of kind of monoculture of the tourism economy. So the glass uh, we fashioned uh, with the sun is, was shaped on the shape of the, on the Ganigo, as I said before, was used by Franco and the official archaeology to, to weaponize and to validate these, uh, these fictions. As, and following Edward Said, we start to call it fictions of the primitives, because I think it fits, it fits very well with these narratives. Also an installation uh, in which includes archival postcards from the beaches where the sand was sourced um, and then these elements, they sit under the Orion constellation. You can see in the top. Uh, the, the Orion is a feature that appears in banknotes. Uh, the Euro, if you have one, you will start to see some dots running around. Uh, this is made to, um, to impede uh, counterfeiting. But interestingly, uh, it allegedly um, uh, resembles the, the, the European Commission building in, in Brussels. That's what they call Orion, some sort of sorts. So to conclude, um, as COVID-19 has renewed the urgency to, ad to address these issues, fissile folk worldwide has been sounding the alarm over the government's viewing of the blue economy, which includes fisheries as well as tourism, as we have seen in some of the presentations. And they see this as a solution to the deep economic crisis that the pandemic has caused. The blue economy is based on a series of erroneous premises. For instance, it is possible to accelerate growth while reducing greenhouse emissions. That oceans are a natural capital and provide service for the economy. Or that blue growth is beneficial for the environment, for the developing, and I quote, of the poorest, as well as for investors. These false assumptions are devastating the seas and artisanal, artisanal fisheries worldwide. And these false assumptions can only exist when we are divorced from the sea, where we no longer share its experience. So in the tradition of the EU reports, uh, we would like to present you guys with um, people uh, with our recommendation, which is to begin 
to rekindling our relationships with oceanic bodies, to get our feet wet, to work closely with situated and experimental, experiential knowledge and genuinely long-term engagement, and to think with water bodies as a materially situated and differentiated bodies. Now, yes, this is the end. <laughs>Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's actually a lovely note to close um, our presentations on um, this idea of experiential knowledge and long-term uh, visitations and engagements, which are, of course, practices that cannot happen inside a box or <laughs> through a box or through the windows of a box. So thank you both very much. Um, hi, Audrey. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to open up to some questions in the audience in a second, but I just actually, I was really interested in um, your amazing podcast series, and in particular, the um, touching on this concept that you just mentioned, the natural capital paradigm, which is in the heart of the blue economy approach, and the degrees to which we see um, techniques like maximum sustainable yield or natural capital accounting as these sort of boundary objects that sit between kind of population ecology or conservation biology scientific concepts and those are also they, they've actually sort of co-evolved or emerged from economic theory and resource economics and yet it's not very clear what those connections are and and uh, you didn't touch on maximum sustainable yield here but I know that it came up in the podcast so just wondering if you could if you tell us the story about where that came from Audrey, would you like to uh, go? Or so ma maximum sustainable yield would appear uh, hand in hand uh, with the United Nations declarations uh, and the, the creation of the inclusive economic zones. Because once you create that kind of forms of enclosure, mm. uh, you need you need to in the clause 62 was stated that uh, what is informally called li uh, um, leave it or lose it. Mm -hmm. which means like states have the, the, the obligation to fish as much as possible, otherwise other nations will have the right to fish on mm -hmm. their waters. So they need to find uh, a way to measure how much fish is in the water because it's impossible to know. It's a super complex question. Uh, it's unknowable. Um, and interestingly, of, of course, uh, for imperial forestry came at hand because maximum sustainable year came originally from, from forestry. Uh, because, you know, uh, British and French uh, foresters, they will start to think, well, if we, if we cut as much as the forests grow, we will have infinite supply of, of, of timber. It's not timber for heating houses or timber for uh, building houses, or it was timber for building ships. Ships that they will go, you know, to the other continents and, you know, continue this kind of uh, 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 empire of trade. So, Fishery science, they found no other place to measure, to quantify that, for, that something that was created for something else. And now we see, like uh, with, the, with the assessment of tuna populations, we see the COVID um, plot, which is a way that tells uh, politicians and uh, policymakers is beautifully whether we are overfishing or not. And then they use these this kind of boundary objects to create. And then as, as one of the episodes of Jennifer Teleska beautifully argue, you know, like, it's pre precisely management uh, which is affording extinction. It's, it's because this person was able to be into these meetings and to, and to do ethnography within these uh, this agreements that, you know, like, we actually know how this management uh, uh, structures operate, mm -hmm. which actually is, is to, to, to perpetuate extinction, to perpetuate the destruction of, of, of bluefin tuna to the point, you know, that it became extinct and it, and it will be commercially incredibly uh, opportunistic. Can I just add that it was also in terms of being a political tool, it was also came about after the Second World War when the U.S. was, um, how to say, having difficulty um, with Japan in terms of sharing the tuna. And so 
also maximum sustainable yield very much came out of this sort of American flexing of muscle to be able to um, create these kind of so-called scientific measurements that actually were able to benefit their fleets and their catch. Yeah, and also uh, describing nature in in terms of its potential. So it's 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 only known basically through its um, capacity to provide value to someone or something. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and this question of um, of transparency is also super interesting because it connects back to what Arju Muhammad Arju was talking about earlier, which is some of the, the concerns that they have at the ICCA, the Conservation Territories of Life, and the indigenous um, peoples, is that there, there is absolutely no transparency in any of the, um, the kind of these global governance frameworks that are flowing down and affecting people's lives in, in all kinds of ways. And it's only by happenstance for somebody that had managed to uh, access, you know, ethnographically what was going on with these documents. But um, could you just also, I mean, are we saying that, or is your research showing that there's actually these very strong counter movements happening? So that on the one hand, there's all this impetus and noise about doing proactive marine conservation. On the other hand, um, the fisheries partnerships agreements, EU's fishery partnerships agreements are actually completely undermining all of that rhetoric of, of conservation. Is that, am I right in thinking? that's the case? Well, it's maybe not so clear cut. I think every partnership agreement has very specific uh, situation because it's with uh, every different country also has a very specific situation. And I think one could certainly argue that. Um, but I think we should also bear in mind that there's a nuance between the different agreements between the different countries and also that at the moment, there's a greater threat, according to um, fishermen NGO associations that we've been talking to, the greater threat at the moment is actually the illegal fishing that doesn't fall under the fishery partnership agreements. So I think that the fishery partnership agreement, what it does is it enables this ontological framework of extraction, which we think is ultimately problematic. Um, but we should also nuance that the illegal fishing practices are maybe even more problematic than those that uh, come through the fisher, fishery partnership agreements. Not all, but some. Uh, yeah. um, it's also like within these uh, partnerships, uh, there's, not, there's not only exchange, economic exchange for access to resources. So there's also developmental goals embedded, using some of the language of yesterday, embedded within them. So there's certain goals to develop the local art artisanal fisheries, but it's often done from the top-down mm. uh, approach, which means like authorities have a greater power than uh, artisanal communities that's happening in Senegal. Um, but it's also like there is a, a very strong relationship between uh, fisheries, extraction, and migration. You know, like mm. you can see like 80% um, uh, of the crews that uh, call port in Vigo, they are from uh, uh, Northwest African uh, origin. They have moved there. And then they go back to the waters in neutral trawlers and then they cry after, after seeing you know, the massive extraction of, of resources. So like there is a very strong relationship that the EU is also starting to negotiate, you know, like to implement as a, as a kind of externalization of borders. Mm. So for us, this relationship between extraction um, and migration is, is even more clear, you know, through the lens of, of, of fisheries and mm. through, through the lens of, uh, of pelagic, pelagic, pelagic extraction. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, like there's there certain agreements that, you know, um, it's, the, it's not easily recognizable, you know, but in, in within fisheries, it's just like clear cut, you know. Like, mm. Absolutely. There's all the frameworks of extraction, like the CFA, uh, the uh, Central African and West African currencies that continues, you know, to call for, for the extraction of resources in order to access to services or access. Mm. 
Yeah, maybe you can just actually say a little bit more about the West African currencies arrangement, the Euro-Africa concept that you were talking about, because I think that's not very well known about. I would like to give the floor to... Okay, um, certainly. So, um, in brief, Euro-Africa is a, uh, was a, a concept that was crucial to the European Integration Project, uh, so the EEC at the time. And the idea with your Africa is that for the European states to come together uh, and form the uh, EEC, um, it would be predicated upon the extraction of resources in Africa. So there was a, um, this is what would allow, and this is what allowed actually the European Union to take shape. And it came through various forms of, of uh, architectural imaginaries as well, like Atlantropa and et cetera, that you've probably seen. But essentially, um, this was what permitted the European Union to, to shape. Uh, this was in the context of the post-war era where uh, Europe was devastated. And uh, the idea was that African resources would help the European economy uh, thrive. Uh, but it was also predicated upon an extraction of resources and not of people. So the people in the African continent would stay where they are, but the extraction would flow. So one of the examples that came out of this, I mean, obviously the European Union came out of this, but um, one example of the currency that we mentioned is the CFA, which is, um, I forget what it's short for now. Anyway, it's the currency of most of the former French colonies in Africa like Senegal. And essentially how it works is that it's pegged now to the euro, it used to be pegged to the French franc, and it also means that they have to have all, the half of their reserves have to be stored, uh, it used to be in Paris, now it's, I don't know where, somewhere in Europe. So there's a series of ways in which the currency functions, like being pegged to the euro, like not having their own um, uh, because it's pegged to the euro, they can't um, shift their currency according to their own sort of import, export, and value. And because they have to keep their reserves in France, uh, it means that they're uh, effectively France is always having this um, huge reserve that they can sort of play around with. And so the other um, structure is that it's because it's pegged to the euro it's very difficult to trade with other currencies because you have to go through the euro first so it's effectively much cheaper to trade with europe than your neighboring country in Cameroon. and so they i'm just trying to make it short because it's a complex uh, currency i think but it essentially enables the extraction of resources to europe very cheaply uh, and then uh, that's what the more or less what the currency enables, as well as a, a host of other things that that is very difficult for the country to become uh, yeah. independent in any way, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a really good example of um, this use of trade partnerships and trade agreements to essentially perpetuate these resource flow, these historical resource flows that, of course, enriched European centres to the detriment of um, the Global South and um, uh, still absolutely problematic today in terms of, of thinking about, um, yes, trying to balance the sort of, yeah, the impetus to do meaningful conservation and make that align with the trade agreements which are continuing to kind of put additional pressures in specific geographies. Yeah. And it's also in the map that it was shown from the marine conservation areas, you know, the northwest of Africa, which is one of the richest fishing grounds, because mm -hmm. there is also an upwelling system. Um, there was very few. I, 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 I mean, the scale wouldn't allow to see, but you see that like, this kind of incredibly bad uh, areas, incredibly rich, you know, and then there's no protection. You know, you see protections around. You see the confetti of empire. You see the former. Uh, islands belonging to France, the UK, uh, but around Africa there was very, very few, exactly. Mm. And then, you know, like, and then when you, when you, you contrast that map with the migratory movement of tuna, for instance, you can understand why there is so little, mm. you know, like implemented there. So the, those, the, in, in, the, in the context of using maps against maps, you know, like you can, you can, you can start to see like why there's not enough 
conservation areas in that part. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, very, very interesting. So I would like to uh, offer people in the audience a chance to ask a question before we have to close the day. No? Okay. It's a bit late. Okay. <laughs> it is late. We've had a very long day, and I think in that, in that sense we will leave it there. But thank you both very much. That was a perfect conclusion to the day, tying all of these themes together of the enclosure architectures. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Francisco. And um, thank, thank you, everybody who is in attendance today. <laughs>